There we hey. go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Fix the hair. <laughs> how you doing? Good. How are you? Good. I'm Good. super excited okay. about about tonight. Hi, Jesus. Thanks for joining. Me. Uh, yeah. Go. Ahead. Can Go you ahead. hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. Different locations. So yeah. Different internet experiences here. <laughs> <laughs> it's way different in the Midwest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Welcome everyone. We're excited tonight to chat about rating of perceived exertion. Absolutely. Yeah. So um we in our programs we put in rating of perceived exertion for a lot of the efforts, especially the harder ones that um, athletes will be doing and so we wanted to explain that a little bit and then how it relates to speed work um, distance runners oftentimes do well most of the time or if not all the time we'll do extra or we'll do workouts at speeds higher than rpe or rating of perceived exertion zero through three so we want to talk about how we provide instructions on doing that to improve performance when mm -hmm. it comes to races so yeah. Ellie, do you want to just start by talking about kind of the, the range that you tell your athletes for RPE 0 through 10? Yeah, so rating of perceived exertion is basically what it sounds like. It's what your perceived exertion is when you're running. And you can kind of do two different things. You can sort of self-check it while you're running, being like, you know, how hard does this feel? Um, it's a zero to 10 scale and zero is like you're not doing any activity and 10 is like all out effort all out sprint as you go up the scale it's a i think they call it an exponential curve that what it's called mm -hmm. where you know the bottom of the scale like one through five is sort of here and then you get to five six seven eight nine ten and it just gets exponentially faster as you move on through the scale um, and I think, you know, when you're, when you're running, it's important to sort of ask yourself, you know, how hard does this effort feel? And then the same is true for when you finish a run, how hard does the session feel? So there are two sort of different scales that you can use as a coach, um, maybe also as somebody who's self-programming, um, you know, how hard does it feel in the moment? And then asking yourself when the session is done, how hard was the session? Yeah. And so, yeah, so the scale itself is kind of like this. So you know that the numbers basically one through four up to five are pretty like, you're not making big changes in your speed. You're not making, you know, a big jump and you get to six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10. And all of a sudden it should be exponentially faster. Absolutely. How would you describe it? Yeah, I think you, I would repeat everything that you said and then, um, just adding for, for reference, I know you, we've talked about this separately, but for reference, kind of that three to four conversation pace, so you can still hold a conversation, you could recite the Pledge of Allegiance while you're running, and then that, that area, just like you said, that's a little bit harder to gauge if it's a four versus a five or six, is where things start to ramp up. You can definitely feel, I think, when you're at a seven and out of breath, um, or eight, nine, ten, where it's just, again, those, yeah, those, those few may be hard to distinguish depending on the, on the day, but um, 10, obviously, all out sprint, and then I think there's some comparisons to like 5k pace around a seven or yeah. eight as well, yeah, so, yeah. and, but, you know, if you bring pace in, then you may have preconceived notions of what your pace should be at, or where your PR was, so um, just, I think, Figuring those paces out comes down to understanding the scale, like we talked about, and then just going out and running and feeling that out. What would you say is the advantage of using RPE? I think that it takes into account then all the other factors that can stress you out in life. Um, so, you know, you could go out and have your RPE of three to four, your conversation pace could change from day to day based on nutrition, sleep, caffeine, time of day life stressors, work, so many factors. So, but yeah. if you're going out there and just still going at that same effort, regardless of pace or heart rate, um, then you're going to get similar benefits from it. How about you? Yeah, same. You know, I think RPE accounts for the day-to-day -day shifts in, um, you know, how hard something might feel to you, right? So, you know, if you got, you know, six hours of sleep one night and you're scheduled for a hard effort run, 
and maybe your coach has programmed in RP efforts of like nine. And in your head, you're like, oh, I should be able to hit these particular paces for each of those efforts. And you might go out and be like, man, an RPE nine today is actually maybe a little slower. And I think like RPE manages to like be a more holistic approach to your training so that you can account and accommodate for some of those shifts in lifestyle that might influence how hard things feel. And I think, I think that's probably the hardest learning curve of RPE is mm -hmm. first of all, there's a little bit of vagary, right? Like, yeah. you know, an RPE five is hard. You yeah. Know, that's very subjective. Yeah. It's not, it's not very like, like this is what the pace should be. It's very much based on how you feel it should be. Right. Um, and a coach, and my role as a coach, Steph's role as a coach, is to help you kind of figure out where those lines are and either push you a little harder or give you a little grace. But um, the point of RPE is to account for those things. And I think when you're trying to run faster all the time and you, you know, one week your RPE nine is maybe like, maybe for you it's like a seven minute pace and the next week it's a 7.30, it can kind of mess with you a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to know from you, Steph, if, if you've struggled with any of that yourself as a runner and then maybe how you've dealt with it either yourself or with your athletes. Yeah, definitely. For, for myself and, and for my athletes, I'll, I'll talk about myself uh, first. So my experience was, when I first started using RPE, I still kind of based it off pace. It's like, well, it, a comfortable pace is probably within this range based on how fit I was five or 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> in my prime, which wasn't necessarily true. So um, I think that what also helped me, and we won't get into too much today, was getting a heart rate monitor and, and guidance from my coach as far as, okay, this range is probably where that, that more comfortable pace is. Do you think that you could sustain this for hours and hours? And so combined with, with her guidance and heart rate, um, and then just running and feeling it out, yeah. that's, that's what's helped me. Uh, and then as far as the, the harder paces, you know, getting up into, which we'll talk about later, some of the speed work, um, I sometimes think of like for those higher levels, eight, seven to eight, could I maintain this pace, but be uncomfortable for three to five minutes? So, yeah. um, and again, that, that does definitely vary from day to day, but when you go by that effort, I think just like you said, it messes with you less. Like, okay, I, I know I was supposed to do a medium effort run today. I did that. I didn't even look at the time. I feel, feel okay about it versus right. really focusing on that. Right. And and I, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And I think like, I think it's, it, it shows you how much range you have to work with, right? And, I, you know, I think in the running world, there's this like murky middle they talk about. They, I don't know who they is, coaches, <laughs> um, yeah, runners. they do. Whoever they are, they do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the murky middle is, I think, where most people tend to go out. They like, they go out and they just sort of settle into a pace that's like gonna give them a good workout, gonna make them sweat, make them breathe hard. And you get stuck in that like mid range zone. And RPE is, the point of it is really meant to show you like, here's the end range here and here, the top and the bottom. And we need to be sprinkling and layering in things across the entire spectrum. Um, to really start to make progress. And I think that's the point, you know, you, you had said, I think in one of our earlier conversations, speed hides need. Mm -hmm. And I think that really, that expression really captures how, <coughs> oops, how valuable RPE can be. Sorry, that was my charger. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <You're> good. <laughs> um, how valuable RPE can be at helping you realize like, you know, if you're running if you're running and thinking your RPE three is an eight, your RPE four is a seven, 35 is all of a sudden a six. And like, like maybe you're starting to like push too hard in those ranges, we could start to disperse a little bit and say, here's your stretch. You know, here's where we need to be. Reaching down to the, I'm gonna say the lower end of the RPE is, is 
really so valuable and yeah. just another way to stress your body. And I think so many people miss that. They don't see it as stress because it's felt as easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's some of the feedback I got from one of my athletes and she had difficulty finding that, that lower RPE as well. So I ended up giving her some guesses as far as paces go. And yeah. you're exactly right. It's not in junk miles, right? Those lower right. ranges have a lot of benefits for your muscular system, your heart, um, yeah. for even your muscle fibers change to, to become more efficient at those lower, lower levels. So, um, that, but just like you said, to repeat that is, I think a lot of people end up staying in that like five, four to six range all the time. Yeah. And that's where we get, um, just not enough ability to recover and not enough variability along Bingo. that big spectrum that they have. Bingo, you know, stress yeah. plus rest equals progress. Mm -hmm. and, and I think as a runner, it's very hard to view stress as like running slow. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. you don't think of that as progress and quite frankly it it does like it can mess with your psyche in whether or not you're making progress right um and i think that a lot of runners also don't know their true top end mm -hmm. you know and so like part of the exploration of rpe is figuring out the bottom end and then figuring out that top end yeah. how do you go about helping people find their top end Great question. Um, <laughs> but I do want to come back to, to your come experience. Come out with a whistle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I do want to come back to your experience yourself with RPE oh. and that and your athletes too. So do, yeah. should we do that first? Can we do that first? Yeah, let's do that first. Um, my experience with RPE is, is honestly that it's been liberating in a way. Um, I have never felt personally too competitive with running myself. Um, but it has helped me on days where I've programmed for myself to run a little bit more conservatively, just like be okay with that. Mm -hmm. And when COVID happened, um, it all of a sudden, like I was not going to like, my preference would be to go to a flat area to do a run. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of stopped doing that, which meant now I was exposed to a lot more hills during my runs. And that was somewhat unpleasant to be perfectly honest, but using RPE allowed me to say, you know, it's actually running, running the hill, even at my regular pace makes it 10 times harder, either slow it down or walk it and then continue the run after that. And it has given me the opportunity to just kind of like, like step out of myself a little bit I could, in my ego and really reflect on the bigger picture, which is really that I want to maintain consistency, that I want to be able to run fast when I've programmed myself to run fast. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, I really don't want to have uh, any leftover in the tank when I'm programmed to run hard days. So definitely. Yeah. Do you think that people don't find that top end or reach that top end because they're poorly recovered from that middle ground or just because we haven't really pushed them to that? You know, I, I don't know. I think that's a really hard question to answer because for most adults, we're, we're either running alone or sometimes we're running with friends. Um, and I think that for me, competition really drives me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm much more likely to push really hard when I'm competing with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I know like there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I want to compete with myself. And I think runners have a, a decent handle on um, how to self-regulate and how to compete with themselves and compete with others. Um, and I think it comes down to drivers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have a lot of runners who maybe aren't aren't competitive like I am mm -hmm. and are much more doing it for their own self-fulfillments these like goals that they're trying to meet and usually what it comes down to is me saying wow that actually looked pretty easy based on based on their session RPE mm -hmm. so I have runners report back on how hard each session is for them and you know if I program in a hard workout and they're reporting it as a five I'm kind of looking at it like hmm, <laughs> either they could have pushed harder or I could have add more reps. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's a really good point. How do you get them to explore? 
I think that it's one kind of slowing down the, the longer or some of their easy days um, so that they mentally do feel better for that, that faster stuff. And ex I mean, education is huge, right? Like this is why we're slowing you down on these days. Um, but I think it's important that you mention and that we emphasize that in order to run faster, you have to run fast. So yeah. it's not that we, we are saying, you know, all low intensity all the time. That's not it. Yeah. It's just sprinkling that in in appropriate doses rather than just, just like you said, I'm going to reiterate it, sitting in that middle part of the spectrum all the time. Yeah. And so how, how we start, I think, typically just introducing it in small doses um, yeah. with um, some strides which isn't necessarily going to add too much stress, but it's going to help with some, some coordination, just starting to, to gauge how that RPE feels, starting off slower and progressing to a faster speed throughout that stride. Um, and then after that, again, small doses, one to two minutes, um, kind of feeling out that higher end of the middle. So if we're just getting back into some faster work, we don't want to tax them at, you know, 90% all the time, but just dabbling in it, fart licks or um, speed play, right? Yeah. The, what, it, what it means. Um, and, uh, and then as we move on, going through a couple different ranges. So there's that kind of uncomfortable pace for 20 to 30 minutes. And then there's that uncomfortable pace for three to five minutes. So um, I think for RPE, generally saying, and it depends on the person, right? But somewhere between five and seven or six and seven for that 20 to 30 minute um, session. And that could be split up, but that's going to be the total within the session. And then um, between like an eight and a nine for those three to five minute sessions with longer recoveries. Um, and those yeah. have different, different benefits for um, the heart and oxygen utilization and all that. Um, but ultimately kind of playing around with those two throughout the phases of training uh, yeah. I've seen that benefits and performance. Yeah, totally. I think that's like, you know, helping people get up to that top end, you know, shorter speeds or shorter duration is what you're always targeting. Because the goal would be working at a speed that you can't hold for much longer than a minute or two minutes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's kind of like at the top end, that's what you're aiming for. And if you get done with a one minute RPE nine or close to a 10, and you feel like you could go all day, you know you're not running hard enough. Um, and I think that's, that's always a tricky line because you know it's not like we can be there every single day to be like checking in and, and really figuring out if the effort was where it needed to be, um, which is again, why it comes back down to communication. But I think the RPE, does a really good job of teaching people their range and then giving them autonomy and agency over that. Huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's, you know, I've, I have a personal value there, which is like just helping people become more independent in their understanding of what's happening there. Um, and also be able to make their own choices to keep them healthy. You know, I think, you know, some runners just manage to get themselves into unhealthy routines and habits that can burn them out and um, lead to physical just fatigue, mental fatigue, all of it. And RPE can be sort of an honest self-check of like, you know, was this effort where it was supposed to be or not? And should I have slowed down for that or not? Um, it manages to give you some self-reflection. Definitely. Yeah. And I think on that note too, over time, you can kind of gauge any possible, are we overreaching a little bit? You know, was, yeah. was this workout an RP of five and four weeks later, you're starting to feel kind of flat. And now these same, again, maybe paces do come in handy here and you take into account some heart rate um, information, but if that RP, it's now feeling harder and harder, are we kind of coming towards an injury? That's what actually what I noticed a yeah. few times during my stint at running at, you know, five to six to 10, to 10 all the time, was that I'd feel so fit. I'd be like two to three weeks out from a race. I'd be like, all right, this is great. I'm running such a good workout. And then like the week before, my effort was so much higher. I couldn't hit the same paces. 
and it, it was just this pattern over and over so I think if I took a step back and was like okay now I'm definitely leading towards this overtraining and then I keep going ultimately get injured um, yeah. So I think that's an important thing to, to track with athletes and make sure you're monitoring that, you know, do you, we need a down week? Do we need a week off just to prevent anything bad from happening? Yeah. You know, and so much of the running data is like, there's just so much data. We, yeah. as coaches, we can't all be sports scientists at the same time, you know? And I think, <clears throat> I think data has a lot of value. I think that, um, you know, as I've heard so many reputable coaches say, there's no better way to figure out how an athlete is doing than just to ask them. Um, but I think it can help correlate with certain things. You know, if, if I'm programming a five or say I'm programming a two or three, even like just super slow recovery conversation pace and their, their heart rate consistently comes back as they're in like upper zones, you know, I'm starting to ask, you know, are they just, are they um, working too hard when it's supposed to be easy? And should we like try and disperse that F effort a little bit more and say like, like really, really pull it in and, and like force yourself to run as slow as possible to make sure you're in these heart rate zones. It really just gives some insight into where people think they are on, on those skills. Definitely. Yeah, that's huge. And then just always coming back to that communication just like yeah. you said. We, we've talked about this as well how sometimes just watching and this is another vote for rpe right sometimes yeah, yeah. just watching the heart rate which, which has its benefits but sometimes just watching that can be frustrating because yes. you're running easy and you can't control that and you know there there's accurate supposedly right but it still <laughs> has room for error and and uh i, I think that's another another positive for going mostly by RPE. 100%. And I, you know, I find as, I've found as a coach that, you know, pushing somebody too heavy on heart rate can be problematic because of that. And I have had to let go of my desire to really like want to use the data to help improve somebody's performance. And again, that comes down to the, the fun of coaching is like the push pull, you know, athletes are consistently um, pushing you as a coach to push them and and pulling in ways that you may not want them to like like if you think they're running too fast too often and their potential is limited because of that you know the conversation to figure that out really centers on RPE in my book you know it, it comes down to like okay having a conversation of where do you think your RPE 3 is where do you think your RPE 10 is is that range actually being tapped? You know, do they think an RPE 10 for them is an eight and an RPE three is a nine? Well, that is not an exponential curve. <laughs> that is like a very, like very gradual curve. And is there an opportunity there to make somebody faster by just engaging them in how to use RPE more effectively? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say so? Can we get into a little bit more about how you use that? Um, maybe not, you know, specific details of, oh, oh, I knew that <laughs> I was afraid of that. It's okay. I saved it. Didn't go all the way. Um, because I like hit the table. I was stimulating so hard. <laughs> um, how you help people tap into the, that top end speed or just those higher ranges. Yeah, you, yeah, I think, I think sometimes what it'll be is having them do uh, an exploratory workout. And I, I love workouts like that where they're first getting started with speed and it's like progressive, you know, where they'll do, you know, the warm up a little bit and they're, they'll do a short interval at five, a short interval at six and so on and so forth and progressively make the intervals a little shorter so I can see where they think those speeds are. Um, and sometimes you'll see that, that they're maybe a little bit conservative or um, vice versa or whatever. Uh, but I think workouts like that can reveal a lot about where they think their potential is. Um, and that's, that's how I tend to engage them in that conversation is through like a progressive, maybe ladder or something of that nature. And really getting, especially when I get somebody new on board, really getting a picture of where they think those numbers are. 
Um, certainly it can happen through a conversation too. Uh, I just think that a lot of people who engage with me as a coach don't under, don't know RPE out of the gates. And so if I were to get somebody on a call and be like, where do you think your RPE three is? They'd be like, oh, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. And so I really, I try to implement RPE from more of an interactive way, like engage with the RPE don't shy away from it. You know, I, I know there are like ways to simplify the scale. I just don't think that, um, I think m most people are really quite intelligent and have a good self-awareness about where those numbers should lie. So um, I try to engage them in the scale and really get them invested in what it means to them. Mm -hmm. And that's where I garner, I think, the most information. What about you? Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think, Pretty similar to what you said. Um, I like the idea of kind of doing different intervals at the, the different levels. Um, I've done a little bit more of like progression runs at that or um, gradually working into an interval workout. So we'll do, you know, yeah. five minutes at RPE four or five at RPE five and then get into some of our intervals or, or some threshold work. Um, but I like the idea, especially early on, of doing some maybe one or two or three minute intervals at those, yeah, those yeah. progressive paces. So um, just yeah. to touch on it's that. Like asking yourself, oh, how hard can I run for a minute? You yeah. know, like yeah. you're curious about that. Maybe, it, maybe it's actually way faster than you thought when you first started. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And even within that minute, right? Like, how are we, how are we doing this? Are we coming out the gates fast? Are we right. slowing down towards, you know, or are we working up to it? And um, so that's where the within session RPE and total session RPE are, are definitely important. Yeah. Um, so we getting, have a question. Oh, oh do yeah. you see a question? Oh. Oh, it's behind your computer, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you ever use heart rate or power to help establish better understanding? Definitely. I think in in cases like uh, mine initially, in my background, I ran in high school and college. I was pretty elite in high school and then was injured pretty much all through college. So um, for me, heart rate helped a ton because I had these set paces in my mind that were supposed to be conversation pace. And once I got my heart rate, monitor, it was showing that I was closer to 80 to 85% of my max heart rate that whole time. So I think it, it was very important at the beginning. Um, and now it's, it's less important for me. So in those cases, yes, I think that's very helpful. Um, but in some cases, and I even work with a few athletes who um, they they just have it on their watch or they just have a Fitbit. And so I don't know how accurate that really is, but they're good at gauging RPE or uh, we've kind of taught we've talked about it a lot and and worked through some of the paces so I don't force everyone to get a heart rate monitor or anything like that um, but it, I think there are cases where it, it can be helpful power um, not so much I know there's little like power things you can put on your shoe now <laughs> um, but I know for um, triathletes they use that a lot on the bike but I don't necessarily yeah. use that how about you Ellie yeah same basically the same story you know I've got I've I've personally really struggled with how to engage with using heart rate zones with recreational runners in a really productive way. Um, Cause I just think it ends up becoming if, especially if they don't like they care about the data, but not so much that they have to nail it perfectly, but it just becomes too much information. Um, and so I, I think there is great value in using heart rate. There's no doubt about it. Um, I just think that, for most of the runners that I end up working with, um, most of them don't need it to make really excellent progress and to make PRs. You know, I had all of my runners last year PR'd in something, all of them. And so, you know, none of them were using heart rate rigidly. And um, so I use it, I would say I use it more from a data perspective to help me figure out how I could maybe push or pull a runner in a direction to improve that progress. Mm -hmm. um, so if it looks like, like I've said, some of those easier runs are not in aerobic zones and they're consistently not in aerobic zones, I'm starting to wonder, are they pushing too hard or is there something wrong with their monitor that needs to be like calibrated? Right. Um, in terms of power, never used it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I think like, I think of power, I think of 
cycling more so. Um, you might like if you're working with sprinters, that might be a really useful tool to use. I think with endurance runners, it's not quite something that I've ever thought I needed to use to help uh, an endurance runner improve their performance. No, I don't think I know any coaches who do. I mean, I haven't really asked though. So, um, but yeah, I think you're right, potentially with sprinting and cycling. Yeah, yeah. You know, power by definition is like the ability to move fast over short bursts, right? Like, like yeah. that would be my definition of power. I'm sure right, there's right. like a much better, more scientific way to define power, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the equation, but no, I, I think you're right. I'm not sure what the there may be some utility in distance runners that I don't know, but I am not sure. Right. Yeah, same. But great question. Yeah, really great question. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the RPE. I think in a basic nutshell. Yeah. I feel like you want to add. I feel like there was something else I wanted to add, and now I'm forgetting what it was. I don't think so. I think our our big points are just creating some variability in running and we don't yeah. want to run at that same pace the whole time and don't be afraid of those conversation pace miles because those actually have a lot of benefits yeah. so that i mean one is less stress so that you can hit those higher end speeds and, and or improve your performance by stressing your system with those I'm using my little <laughs> exponential imaginary exponential curve here um and it might be backwards if this is i know <laughs> <laughs> um, but the so that you can get to those higher ones that are going to stress you enough to cause improvements yeah. uh, and and it, yeah so just making sure you are you have to run fast to get faster but it shouldn't be and doesn't have to be and definitely shouldn't be all the time yeah yeah the time. and you know the the science on this really kind of right now is pointing us towards like 80 percent of your running is spent at like one to four mm -hmm. of, of the RP scale. That's yeah. like the, the bulk majority of your endurance running should be spent down here. Mm -hmm. And that's another really hard, hard sell for a lot of runners who want to get faster is understanding that junk miles, junk miles are your miles. That's where you make progress. That's where you see benefit getting a ton of volume. You know, certainly like we've said, to get faster, you do have to run faster. You have to know what that feels like. You have to stress your ecosystem, your muscles, your heart, your lungs, all of it to be able to do that effectively and efficiently. But there is no, there is no better way to get better than just to run a heck of a lot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that volume is huge. It's so um, I think there was, shoot, what was my other point in that? Oh no, I had something else. Oh, um, <laughs> and, and I've gotten feedback as well that turns out a lot of times running is actually more enjoyable when you run in those, in those slower, slower, those lower heart rate or VO2 max zones. And, um, you know, there were times where every run, I'd go out and be like, oh, I'm dreading this again, I'm dreading this again. And that doesn't have to be your life. <laughs> you know, yeah. you can actually, actually slow down, down and get more benefit and have and more enjoyable have runs. You know, go on a run with a friend and actually talk the whole time. Um, you, have to be, you have to be willing to disconnect from the objective measure of pace. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think pace, the objective measure of pace it like gets in the way of people's progress because it's their only way to measure their progress is whether or not they're getting faster. Mm -hmm. And instead we need to be asking, how many times are you running per week now compared to what you were? How many miles are you running per week now compared to what you were? Mm -hmm. um, things of that nature can help runners see that they're making progress in other ways. You know, it's just like paces, I think there's such a stigma behind pace. And if you use RP well, and you're able to attach to it and embody what it is really truly meant to do, which is meant to make you better, 
um, you can start to let go of pace. And again, that makes running, as Steph said, way more enjoyable. <laughs> that you can just go out on a run and just have a jolly good time. Yeah, yeah. And that <laughs> Look around, smell the flowers. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think your water, you know. <laughs> And coming back to last week's conversation too, this is where, if that's still difficult for you, this is where a coach can be extremely helpful. Yes. Having someone not only to tell you to do that, but keep you accountable to that. Yeah. And like I said, all of my runners last year had PRs and they all used RPE. That's it. I mean, I didn't start getting, I'm going to say more serious about using heart rate until this year. And so you know, now I'm using heart rate. And I'm like, I don't know. Is it working? <laughs> <laughs> it just is, it's such a reliable way to hold people accountable to themselves and also give you a gauge for where they're at with their training. Absolutely. Yeah. And well give you yourself a gauge. Yeah. Yeah. And just like you mentioned earlier that stuck out was the autonomy, you know, just understanding that skill for each individual runner gives them the freedom to play around with that speed and and help themselves get better so yeah awesome. yeah um i do want to ask another question real quick about heart rate mm -hmm. um because i think that most people who think of maybe not most people rpe is a little bit more vague right it's like where would you say heart rate lies on the RPE scale? Oh, good question. Um, I would say between zero and 75% and of your heart rate max, which don't always just take the 220 minus your age. Um, there's a ton of variability in that. So um, with all the data that we have from these guys, if you had a 5K run that was recent or um, a hard workout that was recent, the either whatever app you use, Training Peaks pulls up the max heart rate over however many workouts you've done. So that can be a good gauge for you individually. Um, but I would say zones one and two, like those lower between zero and four efforts are probably going to be lower than 75% of your max heart rate. And then um, the, the ones above that. So if we work down then, so 100% to about 94% of your max heart rate would be that, that high zone, zone five. Um, I think it's about 94 to 88 and then 88 and below. But um, yeah. I think there, there's some more research on that that would give you specific. That a, but, does that sound about right? Situation. I was like, give me the zones. <laughs> give me the percentages. <laughs> yeah. So with, with, I think they correlate very well with RPE though. So that's yes. probably going to be. Your yes. Point. And that's the thing, you know, heart rate, your watch doesn't tell you what your RPE is, you know, and like most runners have a watch, you know, and it's really easy to see like what heart rate zone am I in? Am I one, two, three, four, five, you know, just straight out of the gates. And it's important to ask yourself, does the zone I'm in correlate to how I feel? Because if you're using data, like data, Data can give you a ton of really useful information, but at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself if the data you're getting is accurate to what your experience is as well. And so I think that's another way that you can kind of help somebody engage in the RPE is like, you know, great, if you're on a conversation pace run and you, your heart rate is reading in zone three, ask yourself, do I feel like this is hard? <laughs> You know, it's a hard right. pace. Yeah. Um, if it's not, then stay the pace you're at. And I think that's majority of the time going to be fine. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, more. I, I, feel like, I feel like there's more we could probably touch on. But I think if you have questions about RPE, ask us. One. Yeah. Two, you could download our one of our programs, 5K or 10K. And the scale is listed in there with the zones. Um, and yeah, one or two, ask us, <laughs> or yeah, yeah, just reach out. maybe one of these days I will like write about RP, who knows? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great idea. Just <laughs> you would take a transcript from this and there you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. That was, that was super yeah. fun. That um, was 
Next week we'll be on probably on Wednesday again. The time and subject will be we have it determined, but we'll announce it early next week. And uh, we're down to about four weeks before the the virtual race that we um, put on the quarantine 5K and 10K. So you can still sign up for those if you'd like. Um, and there's going to be a post race Zoom call. Yes, a beverage of your choice, and then a raffle with some swag. So. Um, oh, and we're donating some of the profits from that race to Black Girls Run. So, yes, um, yes. Get ready for that. Sign up. It'll be July 19th, so just around the corner. Yes, it's just around the corner. You can pick, oh, somebody had asked, you know, how do you pick a course? How do you oh, pick yeah, a course yeah. for the yeah. race? What would be your answer? If you're able to find a, a trail or here in Arizona, we have a canal with some loops. So I would, I would try to find an area that you can plan out either two or 3.1 mile loops or, you know, a couple mile loops. Just make sure that you don't have to cross traffic, obviously for safety reasons and <laughs> first and foremost safety, um, but also so you don't have to stop and restart. Yes. Um, so some places have green belts, just uh, like golf courses. There's one right by where I live that's open to the public. Make sure you check that first. <laughs> um, but those are some good, relatively flat paces, places to, to find your course. Yes, I would agree with Steph on that. You know, I think I, the ideal scenario is always to find a flat or a downhill, <laughs> if at all possible, especially if you're looking to set personal PRs. Um, and I don't know if you view that as cheating, but sometimes it just is a good way to boost your ego. Um, and similar thing to find somewhere that doesn't have lights or traffic so that you don't have to find yourself stopping. And again, for safety reasons. Yeah. So a good portion of parks, you know, in the Seattle area, there's like the Burke Gilman Trail. That'd be a perfect spot for it. You could do an out and back. Um, really the fun of doing a virtual race is to create your own course, you know, you make it yours, like spell something out if you want. <laughs> yeah. And if you haven't run in that area before, you can just go on mapmyrun.com and it will, you can just put a dot somewhere and they may have this on other apps. It's not just the website now, but you just put a little dot and measure out exactly how far it is. Yeah. That my run is the perfect sort of classic way to, to map a run. <laughs> Super easy. <laughs> Too. it's really easy to use yeah yeah I think it's free too I, I mean I've never paid for it yes. so it's got to be yes great. I agree awesome and to finish up we wanted to just let you know that we have something exciting to announce um but we're not going to announce it yet <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned Is that the way to do an announcement I think <laughs> so I think that's how we do it <laughs> so yes we have some exciting stuff coming up um, so keep your eyes and ears open and uh, yeah. look out for that announcement. Yeah, cool. Awesome. All right. Well, if there are no questions, I think that'll be it for tonight. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Thanks, Steph. Always good to chat with you. Yep. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk soon. All right. See ya. Bye.